Okay. okay, then let's um, continue and uh, get a little bit closer to maybe us understanding what we discussed in the last uh, hour. So we're now doing it visually um, because there's usually not much sense in doing things visually, but I think here it's, it's okay to do things a little bit visually. So what do you see here? Um, Ah, uh, um, oh, no signal, sorry. Um, what you see here? Can somebody please close the door? Okay. So now, what you see here um, in B? So this is uh, straight from the uh, script. Um, are um, the onsets? of trials of an experiment, an fMRI experiment with two conditions. And we will look at this in fMRI and if you have done something in your long uh, spring break, you should have also seen that also actually in your uh, new cognitive methods um, programming project because it's all the same thing. It all refers to this checkerboard data. So you have two conditions and, and can you stop moving your leg there? Thanks. Uh, because it's, it's a constant visual uh, stimulus in, in my visual field, which is, thanks. Um, so uh, the, um, there are two conditions, um, a high and a low contrast uh, visual checkerboards. And what you see here um, are onsets during a run. So on the x-axis, you have time. So um, let's say time in seconds here. And um, you see that um, you have two things. One is uh, blue here, the other one is red. And what this represents is that whenever there's a um, kind of the stick um, in um, on, on the time axis, that means a trial of the, um, um, the, the specific condition was presented. Yeah. So the way to read this plot is um, this is condition one. These are the stimulus onsets. This is time, and then you see that uh, in briefly before 50 seconds, um, the uh, condition one was presented, and it was also presented around 10 seconds. This one shows condition two, for example, a uh, low uh, contrast checkerboard or some other abstract condition. I mean, it's it's abstract after all. And um, this uh, was presented here, let's say, around um, 30 um um, seconds after the beginning of the run. You see that um, this is kind of uh, um, yeah, uh, interleaved. So um, here first uh, condition one is presented, then condition two, then condition one again, then there's a, uh, three times um, condition two, twice condition one, twice condition two, one time condition one, one time condition two, twice condition one and one time condition two. So that's uh, what is referred to in uh, the fMRI uh, language, um, what you see here as stick functions. Um, so they represent as, uh, essentially the timings of um, the specific condition trials um, during a run. And um, here the run has roughly about uh, over 250 um, seconds if we're only looking at that. Yeah, so this is what happened uh, to the participant uh, during the run. There's a question. Yeah, so the, um, um, the, um, this uh, is not a measure. So this is your um, independent. Uh, so this is the first step towards uh, your uh, formulation of the independent variables in your design matrix. And um, the um, this in this case encodes um, the same strength for both uh, stimuli and um, does not account for um, stimulus strength power or anything. Um, essentially, uh, you often do that in this kind of normalized way to see in which um, um, brain area one or the other um, um, thing has more of an effect. And the effect, as you know, is encoded in the better parameters. And then you want to make sure that you're, the way you drive that is actually um, normalized over conditions. One could do what you uh, um, uh, propose to do, but it's in general um, not done. And um, 
also often here, of course, with high and low checkerboard contrast, it's quite clear that you have kind of a measure of strength. But in, if you are more uh, in a, um, a cognitive domain, for example, if you have uh, um, pictures of faces and houses, so what's stronger, a face or a house? Um, yeah, in a certain brain area, the response will be bigger for uh, um, uh, one of these stimuli, but uh, stimuli. But in general, you cannot put a quantitative measure on a stimulus or trial class. So this is also why you don't do that. Okay, good. Other questions about this uh, plot here? No. Good. So remember, these are the condition onsets. Now, what we are looking at here are uh, the observed uh, time courses, so look at C now, the observed time courses from two voxels. Yeah, so um, remember that I told you uh, before that uh, you acquire the data in kind of this voxel grid over time, so that means for each voxel you then have a time course, and this is what is plotted here. Um, so here you have the MR signal on the y-axis over time, and this is the same time scale, of course, as um, here. And um, you see that um, the MR signal, um, so this is now measured signal, of course it's simulated in, 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 the, in the handout, but in ideally you would uh, actually observe such a signal, and it, it's quite close, maybe not as strong, but it's quite close. Um, and um, you see over time um, there is some excursion of um, the voxel MR signal. Now, the, you have two voxels here. So this is voxel 1, this is voxel B. Um, if you compare the voxel time courses that you see here with the condition onsets here, what is going on? That's the question. So maybe let's look at voxel A only first. And um, now try to visually link condition 1 and, con and or condition 2 with this time series and then have a guess what's going on with voxel A. Anyone else? Have a look. So there's a, a stimulus is presented at this time and then Maybe something happens or nothing happens. So what's going on with this voxel? Mm -hmm. Sorry? It's responding to condition one. Yeah, and what it's doing with condition two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So um, visually, uh, well, this, uh, so, um, if you just visually try to look at that, um, there is actually one thing that's tricky um, is there is actually, a, and I forgot to say that, there is actually a, a, a stimulus presented at time zero here. And this time zero is this first peak. You know that the um, hemodynamic response function is a little bit delayed. And then you have um, this one and this one, which are shown here. Then you have kind of a break which is when um, the stimulus uh, 2 um, onsets are presented. And then you have two stimulus 1 uh, presentations again. You have these two peaks, a little bit of a break, and so on. So you get the logic. Yeah. So this one is, pres uh, is uh, um, apparently responding to, um, um, stimulus, uh, to condition 1 of the stimulus. Now, what's going on with voxel B? Exactly. So this, uh, there you have a peak whenever there was a stimulus shown. So this is the uh, first one, then this one, but then it also, it doesn't take a break, but it just uh, continues working. So this is, I should not make funny jokes. Good. Um, <laughs> these are master students, and these are postdocs. Anyway, uh, just kidding. Not quite. Okay, so uh, we've seen that uh, this voxel always uh, takes a break and only works uh, during uh, term time, so when um, condition 1 is presented, and this voxel always responds all the time um, when condition 1 and condition 2 is presented. Okay, so you can basically see that uh, by looking at, uh, by knowing two things, you, so you know when the um, um, 
stimuli were presented and you know how the data looks. Now what the GLM and fMRI uh, does is um, just bring these two things um, together and um, yeah, quantify them and give you essentially a single number that you can plot on the brain um, uh, or an anatomical image um, to, to see that. Now, how is that done? Well, it's uh, done in much the same way as uh, one, as we discussed in the winter term in, in statistical methods. Based on your conditions, uh, you create regressors in your design matrix um, that try to predict um, the um, signal. And the way that this is done is that you put in a little bit more knowledge than just uh, that there is an onset of the trial. What you put in in addition is that uh, the um, idealized response um, to um, a stimulus, if the brain response, is this hemodynamic response function, which you can um, see here and which you have learned about in the winter term. Yeah. Remember, it uh, peaks after like five or so seconds after the stimulus, and then it has this post-stimulus undershoot if you model it. The important thing is that this is a response function, so this is a math mathematical, mathematical model of a hemodynamic response, but it, of course, uh, the idea where this is coming from is um, that you have measured these responses, for example, for a visual stimuli um, um, yeah, a couple of times and then come up with this idealized model. The question is then always, so for what kind of stimuli have people actually measured that? Yes, essentially only for visual stimuli and yes, essentially only from V1 and yes, you use it all over the brain and yes, the uh, hemodynamic response might be different in different brain areas. So uh, the own, uh, uh, own research field on its own, but there are ways to also account for differences in hemodynamic response functions uh, over the brain by, um, for example, um, uh, also modeling hemodynamic uh, response function derivatives. Um, what you now do um, to um, actually get a prediction uh, for the signal is that you um, convolve um, the stimulus onset time with the hemodynamic response function to get these kind of predicted MR signals. So wherever you had an onset here in the um, in your stick function, you essentially now have a hemodynamic response function. This step, convolving um, um, stick functions with hemodynamic response function, is a topic of its own, and you will be able to read in my book about that. Um, and I discussed that in previous years also in the summer term, but we will not do it uh, this term. It's interesting. It's uh, discrete time um, signal processing. Um, it's not as trivial as one one might see, think because it's not that you like put into a matrix just uh, wherever there's a, a, a the stick function. You just pull in kind of and concatenate hemodynamic response functions. It's a little bit more than that. And it also has certain implication in terms of how you interpret uh, the signal because it embodies uh, the whole theory of lin linear time invariant systems. But this is something that we will not talk about. Yeah, you will be able to read about that in uh, my book, which yeah, I now have to promise you will be done by the end of the year. And then you can, of course, take the summer term next year, where I might discuss it again or not. The thing is, visually, and it, it's, it's technically not trivial, but visually and essentially what it does is that it replaces these stick functions with these uh, more uh, hemodynamic uh, function-like things. And hence, it's maybe not of the biggest interest um, to you. So maybe this is also why I'm not uh, discussing it. So no convolution this summer term. Um, now, what do you do with these predicted MR signals? They are your regressors in the design matrix, and they get put into the design matrix. So let's put them into the design matrix. And there we have it. So this is a crucial step that you need to do. Um, so this is now a design matrix, how it looks in uh, fMRI research. It has, um, in this case, 180 rows, and it has two columns only. And what these columns are, are just uh, the gray uh, um, value representations of this predicted MR signal and this predicted MR signal. So this this thing becomes the first column and this thing becomes the second column, which you can see again um, 
uh, if you look, um, so it's, it starts here and then it does the other one and then there's this break where the second uh, condition was presented. Yeah. So these um, predicted MRs uh, 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 signals, which you get again by convolving your stimulus onset with the hemodynamic response function, they make up the column of the um, um, the columns of the design matrix. And as we discussed previously, these design ma matrices, they are applied to each and every voxel uh, in the brain and um, or in your um, in your data, I should say. And um, now um, the question is then what happens if you apply this design matrix, um, and this is the same for both cases, to voxel A or voxel B, uh, what, yeah, what happens? So uh, now think again uh, that let's start sorry let's start again with oops, uh, let's start again with a voxel A. So as we already by just looking at it and thinking about our um, uh, time course of the uh, onset, what we've seen is that this responds uh, only to condition one. Now, if one looks at it in design matrix form, this column here is uh, encodes the predicted MR signal for uh, condition one and this for condition two. Now, we know we have observed this uh, thing here, uh, which is only responsive to um, condition one. So you can see here the bright white means that the signal was up. Think again, that is just this time course, um, like for the design matrix transposed and then represented in gray values. So higher values get lighter and uh, lower levels get darker. So again, it's still, it's the same data. It just responds to um, um, the first condition. What does that mean in terms of um, the true but unknown better parameters slash the better parameter estimate that you get? Well, there you have to refresh your uh, matrix multiplication thing and uh, think again what the better parameters do. So if you think of this uh, um, NTR times two um, design matrix and you multiply it with, um, let's say, a true but unknown better parameter value, um, well, you see the answer in front of you, so it makes no sense to do that interactively. Um, the um, the way you get from this uh, design matrix um, to these observed data is that you multiply the predictor for um, condition one with one and uh, add to it um, the um, value for um, um, predictor two multiplied by zero. Because what that does is that if you think about in terms of how you do um, matrix multiplication, and you all know how to do that, I've seen it in the exam, um, is that if you, for example, are um, at this thing here, so where I have this little, cr uh, where I have this little cr uh, hand cross now, if you are here, you multiply zero by one, and then these uh, values here, these larger values, which are just these values here, so it's around 0 0.2, you multiply it by uh, 0 and you get nothing in the uh, observation. So this would be, um, this is why I don't have anything above here, this would be like the true but unknown better parameter. Now if you estimate the better parameter, what do you think you would estimate uh, for voxel A for the better parameter? Roughly. So what would be the values in your better head estimate? If the true but unknown values are this, the noise level is relatively low, because you can clearly see what's going on in the data. So what do you think you estimate for uh, voxel A in terms of your better parameters? More than zero. No, roughly one and zero. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's essentially with this low noise level, you essentially estimate one and zero. There's a little bit of a deviation, so it's 1.0023 and uh, minus zero, zero, 0001 or so. But you essentially estimate these true but unknown values, which of course also uh, you know, even if the noise level would be larger uh, and you average over them, then you of course Markov Markov uh, theorem and it's an unbiased estimator, so you uh, estimate. Uh, uh, actually these values. So you can, once you have estimated this, you can of course multiply your design matrix with the estimated uh, value and then overlay uh, these. And this is what you see here. 
So here you have the um, data that you have here, and now you have the data again, but with uh, dotted lines um, and overlaid uh, in, in pink here, the estimated um, uh, values, yeah, based on the estimation of the better uh, parameters. That means, essentially, and this is an important thing, this is really the important thing, so try to get this into your uh, head, brain, whatever you call it, uh, the mind, maybe, mind and brain. Um, so the, uh, the important thing is that the specificity of a voxel to a, a certain condition gets encoded into the beta parameters. Yeah? So the beta parameters reflect the condition or uh, yeah, the condition specificity of a voxel, of a single voxel. Because voxels can be different, they can have different better parameter estimates and they can uh, reflect different specificities. But the important thing is that this sensitivity to a certain condition that gets encoded, I say it again, into the better parameter estimates. Yeah, so this is something that you really, uh, yeah, just memorize it at first. And then once you have it memorized, then think about what it means and then um, uh, um, you know what's going on. The thing is, like I said earlier, you can see that and you uh, you can see that basically just by looking at the stimulus onsets and uh, looking onto this. But then by this framework of convolving the onsets with um, the hemodynamic response function, um, yeah, you 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 have it, you get it in a in this case in two numbers. Yeah. And um, of course, if you have more conditions, then that might be more than two numbers. Let's before we um, um, get to that, briefly talk about uh, the other voxel. Um, so this voxel was responsive for both uh, conditions based on the same design matrix. And I mean, you can see it, but maybe uh, explain it to me. Uh, what do you think the true but unknown better parameters slash the better parameter estimates need to be for voxel B? 1, 1. 1, 1. Why? <laughs> Both can? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, or in, in even more mundane terms is that um, if you multiply the design matrix with these two values, then whenever you have something in uh, something non-zero in either this column or in this column, um, and you multiply by one and add the two up, you will get something uh, in the data. So one one again for the better estimates that would be um, uh, it's also roughly the same. And again, the condition specificity um, is encoded in the better parameters. You also see that these better parameters are different if the box is only responsive to uh, one condition versus it's uh, responsive responsive to two conditions, right? Now, the better parameters are still, um, in this case, only two numbers. Um, and uh, But of course, if you have more conditions, then um, you might want to um, condense that even further. So um, what you can, of course, do is um, based on um, these, based on better parameter estimates, uh, evaluate uh, T values. So who remembers how you compute a T value? you just learned that formula so you should actually uh, remember so what goes into the formula for the t value the exactly that goes in what else the variance, the variance uh, estimate exactly which we didn't see here at all and what else Uh, yeah, they also go in there, but more indirectly. Uh, so there's something that also goes in directly. Uh, the yeah, the contrast weight vector. And there's one more thing. Yeah, the design matrix also goes in, but um, the important thing here is the con. So the one, the more important thing in a way is here the contrast weight vector, which um, is uh, so. How many entries are in the contrast weight vector? No, definitely not n. 
unless by n you mean the number of parameters, which would be weird because we call it the number of parameters always p. So how many entries are there? Hmm? No. P, yeah, so the number of parameters. I just said it like a minute ago. Um, so, uh, yes, so there are uh, the number of parameters entries because you multiply uh, the parameter vector with the contrast weight vector um, in a dot product uh, fashion, which means um, that uh, you uh, get back how many values? One, exactly. And so you condense the better parameter estimates, which might be in this case two or even more values. Of course, if you only have one condition, it's only, only one value. But if you have uh, more than uh, one uh, condition, it's usually two or more. Uh, you condense that to one value, which is uh, the, uh, um, yeah, what is called in, in SPM is actually called the contrast image or the values in the boxes of the contrast image um, and you divide it by the standard deviation um, not by the standard deviation but in a measure of the variance uh, as we discussed and you know the formula for the t uh, value and you should uh, um, remember that of course and then uh, you get a t value and depending on um, how you set the uh, contrast vector this which seems kind of be the biggest task for uh, everyone who's studying out with fmri to understand what these contrast vectors uh, do and then everybody's always horribly confused this is why we study the um, uh, t formula of the t value yeah so th we don't do this because it's cool but we do, do it because we want to understand how we need to set the uh, contrast uh, weight vector for example, in SPM, when we do uh, um, an fMRI data analysis using the GLM. Yeah? And depending on how you set the contrast weights, you then test a certain null hypothesis um, and um, condense the whole thing into, um, for each voxel, into a T value. And these T values, they are then the thing that you uh, hopefully are familiar with. So who has seen a, a, something like this? That's not all of the master students. Are there any master students who haven't seen something like this? No, good. So you all have seen something like this. So this is a, um, the typical way to display what is called a statistical parametric map. Actually, it's uh, showing only parts of the statistical parametric map because it's masking out or uh, basically leaving translucent things that are below a certain threshold of t-value. So you see that there's nothing really red on this uh, brain. But this is um, a representation of the t-values. Yeah. Good. Um, and now I'm showing you uh, this uh, um, the same thing in SPM. And while I'm doing that, I will also uh, again tell you what we are looking at uh, in the summer term and what we are not looking at. Yeah. Good. So who has started analyzing the new cognitive methods uh, fMRI data? So I wasn't that wrong with my box uh, master student. Uh, Thingy. But maybe you studied the whole thing, uh, so then uh, you were busy anyway. So this is SPM, and let's see whether I get it to work. Um, so luckily I put it on the path already. Um, and what we are now looking at is the statistical modeling uh, part of um, SPM. And at one point it might also have actually initialized. Really doing long. Um, so there we go. Good. So this is the very beautiful uh, graphical user interface. It really looks like 2018. I mean, you cannot really think of something more modern than this. Um, and um, what we want to do is now actually analyze one run of the data that you are looking at in your new cognitive uh, methods uh, programming project and um, which we also have looked from a theoretical perspective already because we had these two conditions we had only two voxels here we will have um, the voxels that make up a whole um, brain volume um, and uh, yeah so we essentially know what's um, going on we start with um, pre-processed data um, so this is um, 
data that has been pre-processed and has not been uh, put into the bits format that you can see. Actually, it tells you who the participant was and that the participant doesn't have a, a middle name because there's an X. I'm not called Dirk Xavier Ostwald. I'm just Dirk Ostwald. Anyway, so these are pre-processed uh, header and image files. So for each um, TR, um, you get an image uh, file. So this is the image. And you get a header file. So the header file just uh, incorporate, uh, has some information about uh, um, what's going on. And the other ones are image files. Actually, I can maybe I'll briefly um, show you that. Uh, so this is even more beautiful. So and I also selected one image, and you can see we actually didn't scan the whole brain, but um, we scanned only parts of the brain. As you can see, it's cut off at one point. So you have back of the brain, you see that my left ventricle is a lot larger than my right ventricle. It's weird, but anyway. Um, and um, so these are these images, and um, we um, acquired here 441 images. We had actually a very sparse uh, presentation of the stimuli. These are these checkerboard stimuli, two conditions, and these onsets uh, are saved here in this onset file. Um, I think they're called onsets, exactly. And um, as you see, nothing bits here, so fairly idiosyncratic. Um, these are the onsets of condition one, so uh, 25 seconds, 82 seconds, and so on. And condition two, um, onset at seven seconds, 46 seconds, and so on. Yeah, the data has been pre processed. So, this is here what this kind of uh, you can actually change it when you program that. But what these little letters here mean so, F is just functional data, R means realigned, A is slice time corrected, uh, W is normalized, and S is smooth. So, data has been uh, pre processed, and we now want to set up the GLM. Uh, for that and this is what we're going to do and also clarify what we are not going to do um, maybe that's uh, anyway uh, so one way to do that uh, to do statistical modeling is uh, use the batch editor um, and of course when you do it in new cognitive methods and programming and also when we do it uh, real for real we uh, do it with scripts um, because that's fairly easy to do but uh, today i'm showing it uh, with the gui um, so here you can select what you want to do and what we want to do is we want to specify an fmi model so think again in terms of model formulation model estimation model evaluation uh, I just basically ripped that off the general D, uh, um, SPM way of doing things. Um, so let's specify a model. What do we have to do when we specify a model? Well, we have to, the only thing that we essentially have to do is um, formulate the design matrix, basically like I just showed you with these onsets, convolve them with the hemodynamic response function and get the predicted time uh, series. Um, but we, what also happens in SPM is that you tell SPM these onsets and this design matrix belongs to this data. Yeah? So um, what we have to do is um, specify a directory where we want to um, actually get the results of the analysis. Let's see whether um, I get it. So I really don't do this very often, so I'm not very good with the um, interface. So first, uh, we have to specify a directory where the result, where some results of the um, um, of this analysis and especially the design matrix will be saved. So um, I've done that now. Then we have to tell uh, um, something SPM something about the setup of the design matrix. Are are the units in the uh, in terms of time of the design matrix in the data, are these scans or seconds? They are actually seconds, but you have to know that. Interscan interval, uh, did I do that? Yeah. Interscan interval, um, that's the TR um, <coughs> specified in seconds. Um, you also have to know that. That was 1.5 seconds for the data here. Don't know what we did last time correctly. 
Um, then there are some other things, and we will basically not talk much about these other things, although they sometimes uh, come up. Um, they will be, and they are already in my book. Then we have to um, specify data. And um, this is not really setting up the design matrix. This is essentially telling SPM what the Y is. So we have to specify that. And of course, the data is uh, here. And then uh, you can select them uh, and have data. And then we have to specify conditions. So remember, we're now doing the design matrix. Um, we have two conditions. Uh, and the first one we call S1. I want to call it condition one. But let's call it S1 because it's stimulus one. And then, and this is the most important step here, is um, we have to give it the onset. So the stick function that you saw earlier, we have to give it to SPM. And because well, hopefully this is still loaded, um, we can directly evaluate this. Um, yeah. So this is uh, what I loaded into the Matlab's workspace from this uh, file. Um, so I specified that now. The duration, um, we're doing an event-related uh, design, so the duration is zero. Um, and then I think we can how do we work? replicate. Oh, is there already a condition two? Ah, there's already a condition two. How did I get to that? Anyway, um, we also have a second condition, um, which has onsets. And then we have, uh, again, an event-related design. And then we're already done. Um, because we have this green uh, arrow here that says we can run it. There are other things in this uh, specification, for example, this AR1, um, which is actually not an AR1, but refers to the covariance matrix and uh, components. Um, there are a lot of things in this which uh, we will not uh, talk about uh, um, in, in the summer term, um, but we cannot uh, somehow talk about everything. Um, you, for a lot of these things, you will be able to read about them or slash if or whatever uh, you do a master thesis in our lab, you will definitely learn more about them. Um, so now we are ready to actually just formulate the um, GLM. So let's do that and see whether it works. Um, so I will make it. Um, does some stuff. It's still doing stuff. So, ah, that was not what. So, now we have formulated a design matrix. So, this should look uh, vaguely familiar because it's actually what well, we just seen also in the GM. What is there in addition is actually a, um, um, is a, a constant regressor. So, this models the offset. Um, I didn't do that actually in the. Um, in the handout because um, the offset was then assumed to be um, zero. Um, um, SPM always uh, um, yeah, models a uh, run uh, specific offset. So actually we have um, three better parameters, but with the number of better parameters and these pictures here you get from SPM, it's, it's funky because it doesn't show you that it also has many more uh, uh, columns in the design matrix actually, which do the um, high pass filtering. So, yeah, um, but you can actually, if you, so it saves the whole thing in a, um, in a SPM MAT file, which is a structure. So you can actually look at the real design matrix, but essentially is what I, uh, I just showed you a little bit longer. Here it actually t it tells you which images it looks for that, uh, uh, uses for that. Good. So we have now formulated a model. So what's the next step after model formulation? Exactly. So um, then let's estimate this. So we can again use uh, this model estimation. Hello, does it do something? We need to switch on the left. No, no. no. Ah, I don't like that. 
just below. Yeah, I know. And then it wants to do, do both of them or not or whatever. It does. It doesn't do both. Restarting SPM is always great. So let's uh, now estimate uh, the model. Actually, just as a side note, uh, knowing how to deal with the GUI in SPM doesn't make you a neurocognitive researcher at all. It's it's not bad if you know how to do it, but if you know how to do it, then you're not a, a neurocognitive neuroimaging researcher. Yeah, You're just somebody you can click around somewhere. If you have the inner motivation to know everything that it's uh, doing when you actually click there, then you're a neurocognitive researcher. Uh, model estimation. This was kind of this meta things that I always talk about, which also get criticized. Yeah, they are interesting, but they are, uh, I cannot focus them or something. So I should not be that meta always. So now we have uh, said uh, we want to estimate the model. So now it's estimating the better parameters at each and every voxel. So this takes a little bit. It doesn't take forever, but it takes a little bit. Um, and we are um, estimating it uh, using the classical way. You can also do Bayesian estimations, uh, Bayesian, Bayesian estimation. We will not do that. Uh, it's running all over the thing. It, it does some uh, chunks and it actually, it doesn't use um, the simple better parameter estimation that we discussed where you just have this formula, but it using, as you can see here, it's using restricted maximum likelihood, which is uh, a whole framework that goes beyond uh, the maximum likelihood framework because it wants uh, unbiased um, variance estimates and actually using a variance component model. Um, again, these things we will not talk about in the summer term. Um, and also the specific way how it's uh, doing it because it's using two passes of um, um, maximum likelihood estimation. This is also, so if you're really interested in restricted maximum likelihood and want to know why it always says Remmel, the first step would be to read the paper with Ludger from uh, last year that we explained Rammel, um, but it will also be in the book. So now we have estimated it. That's good. And um, let's start SPM again to make this mean crazy. Um, and uh, now we're actually getting closer to um, what uh, we will talk about in uh, the summer term. So once you have estimated a GLM, you can look at the results. Now, uh, the better parameters are determined uh, everywhere, but uh, you have to specify still like a, a now um, a contrast weight vector for some contrast of interest. So let's uh, call this uh, S uh, or stimulus versus baseline. So um, I'm using the um, weight vector 1, 1, which basically sums the better parameters, estimates at each, um, um, sorry, it sums the better parameter estimates at each and every voxel and divides them, of course, by the um, um, standard deviation to get a, a T value. And then uh, we can look at the T values. So um, let's uh, do that. This is also weird because we don't have to specify a zero for um, this column here. It's a little bit funky, the whole thing, but uh, that's how they like it. Um, and now we're getting very close to uh, what we will talk about in the summer term. So we're essentially not talking about this step, but we will talk about this step. So now this, what we, are, what we will see in the next few, or maybe in the next two couple of seconds, this is where we will spend our time until June with, namely this. Done. Done. So this is what we will talk about. Because what it has done now is that it used uh, T values um, based on the contrast um, that uh, I um, specified to show us the T values here, but that's not so much what I'm after, but also to create this uh, table here. And this table contains many P values. It's a lot of P values. I think you have to correct for multiple comparisons here. And um, how it gets from the estimated better parameters slash t values. Actually, we will start with the t values from the t values and um, to these p values. 
this is what we uh, want to discuss and uh, essentially what these p-values mean that you see in this uh, table. Because um, what you will find out is once you have done a lot of pre-processing and uh, changed the parameters again and again, at one point you will write up your paper and then um, you will, um, the question is, so what do I want to report? And your report will always be based on kind of these uh, p-values. And then you always sit there and wonder what do these p-values actually mean. And you're right to wonder because it's actually, it's not, uh, it would be all easy if it's just for each voxel, it says, okay, there's a t-value. Let's look into the t-distribution, find the p-value like you did in unequivalent statistics, put in the table. It's completely not that. And um, because it's completely not that, uh, we will have to um, um, talk about it. So if you want to have a, a nicer view of that, you can, um, because this is kind of what they call the glass brain representation, uh, you can oops, um, you can overlay that on um, a single uh, subject and the confusing table goes away, which is also nice. And uh, you see that... Um, that here, um, because there was a visual checkerboard stimulation, actually on the, only in the left visual hemisphere, the region that lights up most is uh, primary uh, right visual cortex, which uh, makes sense. So um, this last step, and maybe I'd show that again. Um, so selecting somehow this first p-value, and then a table comes. This is what we're going to talk about, yeah, and specifically what these things in the t in the in the table mean. Except, and uh, maybe I should already warn you, except for the ones that start with Q F T R corrected, because um, I don't want to talk about false discovery rate topological inference uh, at this point because uh, I don't want to. Maybe it gets clear why uh, later. Yeah, so that's the topic of the summer term. This was really now practical hands-on, uh, so it doesn't get. Actually, the whole course will not get more hands-on than this. But the other course, neurocognitive methods, is all hands-on. Maybe in DCM, nay, I will not do a DCM with the GUI. I, I rather die before I do that. Sorry. Um, okay. Any questions? Yeah, actually, SPM is not the only, maybe I should also, it's actually not off topic because also these p-values that you see in SPM, you find the same p-values actually in FSL, um, but they, um, um, FSL and SPM use the same uh, theory to get from t-values to p-values. There are different ways to actually get from t-values to p-values and um, other softwares, for example, AFNI or also Brain Voyager use slightly different frameworks to get th that. There's actually a new paper from uh, Tom Nichols out this month who has done something that a lot of people have done over the years. So compare whether FSL and SPM and another software give you the same results. They don't. They're slightly different. That's not too surprising because they're slightly different anyway. Um, how it was done before... Um, uh, SPM is essentially it wasn't done because um, SPM there's this there's a nice article by uh, John Ashburner in the 20 years of fMRI that tells the history of SPM there's also something that you find on the web that it goes a little bit more into detail about the history of SPM SPM was uh, that's a, this is I think the abstract from this Ashburner paper uh, SPM was uh, written by Carl Fristen in 90 in the summer of 1990 the rest is history so fMRI didn't really so SPM was originally written for PET and only a few places did PET and um, there it was essentially where basically you had less voxels and people just did t-tests over the voxels and then with fMRI SPM was always around so it's not that people that too many people actually um, had to come up with uh, their own software but there are different software solutions but the big ones SPM and FSL they actually use this random field theory based approach to um, p-value calculation so that's kind of the short story yeah other questions no good so then let's have a break and we also have to stop actually and uh, see you at 10 in the other room